Nowhere in America do poverty and wealth exist so closely to one another as in New York City. Even from the darkest corners of Brooklyn, one need only look up and across the East River to see the great temples of Wall Street wealth looming over the night. Since the birth of the city, New York's poorest residents, whether Irish, Jewish, Black, or Puerto Rican, have made their own gold from the streets of the city. Sometimes the elements of crime were needed to harvest this gold. But as the violence slowly spread toward the rich and powerful, the apparatus of control, the police and the government, swung into action and, miracle of miracles, New York, the rotten apple, became the safest big city in America. Or, that's the official story. This is the real story of the streets of New York and some of the people that live in them. City, 1970. Heroin is king, teenage gangs terrorize the streets of Brooklyn and the Bronx, and mafia leader Joe Colombo decides to fight the government, not in the street, but on television. I have always maintained and said there is no mafia, there is no Cosa Nostra, and I said that this was only a harassment of the Justice Department, of the administration, and the law enforcement agencies for no other reason than to hurt people, to hurt children, and to brainwash and use the Italian people as the scapegoat for each and every crime that's committed in this country. Colombo's crime family was locked in a war with crazy Joey Gallo. Gallo had allied himself with black gangsters from Brooklyn while serving time in prison. The crowd was still gathering in New York's Columbus Circle for what was to be the mass rally of Italian Americans, when suddenly gunshots, a whole series of them, and Joe Colombo Sr., the principal organizer of this event, was lying on the ground, badly wounded, shot in the head and bleeding profusely. I was standing 10 feet from Colombo when he was shot, and I saw police and a crowd of Colombo's friends and guards seize the man who supposedly had fired the shots, Jerome Johnson, a black man from New Brunswick, New Jersey. Then another series of gunshots, no one seems to know who fired them, and Johnson was on the ground and he was dead. Please do not, please, ladies! This is the type of thing you can't do! Maybe because Columbo's presumed assailant was black, other blacks found themselves in trouble. This angry fright on the fringe of the crowd when it was alleged a black man had pulled out a hatchet. The speculation that Joey Gallo was behind the black assassin of Joe Columbo was never proven, but it certainly showed how crime and drugs could unite the gangster tribes of New York across racial lines. I was born in New York City! A flood of cheap heroin washed over the city, courtesy of the Italian Mafia, and the police department was so notoriously corrupt that the Knapp Commission was set up to investigate the widespread bribery that organized crime used to insulate themselves from the law. Six weeks ago in Harlem, Black Panthers seized large quantities of heroin from drug peddlers and poured it into the street. They refused to turn it over to police because they insisted police would only resell it to the pushers. Some former pushers say police were more interested in getting their heroin than arresting them. On one occasion I was dealing uh, drugs and they came and, and took all my drugs and just let me go. Who's they? The police. Uh, our investigation has certainly shown that we are not dealing with a few rotten apples by any means. But, uh, it's not the rotten apples, it's the barrel. Puerto Ricans had been granted U.S. citizenship in 1917, and after the war, they became the largest group coming into New York. This is the Southeast Bronx, one of the worst of New York's sprawling slums. About one-third of the city's one million Puerto Ricans live in this area. By the mid-60s, the South Bronx was in a state of economic freefall. Every study that has been made indicates that the Puerto Ricans live in the worst conditions of slum housing 
have the worst jobs, have the um, lowest educational attainment, and by every index of health and poverty, uh, are suffering to a greater extent than any other group. Heroin ravaged the population and gangs made up of unemployed and poverty-stricken teenagers with names like the Savage Skulls and the Black Spades ruled the streets. A man probably high on drugs. Scenes like this are common throughout the Southeast Bronx. As the police see it, the reason for the upsurge in crime is the rocketing rate of drug addiction, higher among Puerto Ricans in New York than among any other minority group. Young men stand openly with hypodermic needles in their hands on the main shopping street. I supported my habit by robbing in apartments in my building where I used to live. It worked it, but not all the time, so I would have to go to 42nd Street to sell my body. Sometimes the people knock the door, and the, the person in the house open the door. They try to kill them, and they try to rob them, you know. They, I can't live on here anymore. I can't take any more of this. It's too dangerous. Harlem has always been the capital of black America, the seat of power for many of its greatest leaders, Marcus Garvey, Adam Clayton Powell, Malcolm X. It is also the longtime capital of crime in New York City, used by gangsters and corrupt police officials as a one-stop shop for every vice known to man. The traffic starts in Manhattan. It's uh, more readily obtainable in Manhattan, especially in the Harlem area, up around uh, Lexington Avenue, from about 97th to around 135th Street, 116th Street, 125th Street, and so many other spots, uh, probably take me all day to name them all. Spanish Harlem, once primarily home to Italians, served as the city's heroin distribution center from the 1930s through the mid-70s. In East Harlem then, there was much bloodshed, and the only thing that united Italians and Puerto Ricans was the use of drugs. What about you? Let me see you. Let me see you at your left side. What are you doing with the needle in your hand? In Harlem, street gangs like the ones terrorizing Brooklyn and the Bronx were overshadowed by corporate-style drug rings run by men like Nicky Barnes, Frank Matthews, and Frank Lucas. As me being a Harlem guy, like, I feel like we have a different type of standard where we got to carry ourselves. Like, so we have a way different type of swag than all these other niggas, always. Everybody's trying to keep up with the legacy that the old time was built. Now, you've seen Bumpy with his little hats on and all that. you see Nicky with his minks on. But we still, with that image, will we want to be fresh? We want to be seen out. Heroin laid waste to Harlem like no other community in the United States. In 1970, it was estimated that 8% of Harlem's population between the ages of 17 and 29 were addicted to heroin. The Devil's Rebels, the Dirty Ones, the Crazy Homicides, the Turbans, and the Tomahawks. Gangs in Brooklyn during the 1970s formed for the same reasons as the Bronx gangs, brotherhood and protection in the face of a collapsing economic situation in poor neighborhoods and the spiraling rise in drug use and violence in the street. Like our family wasn't really there for us, so our family was the gang. Right, you know what I'm saying? We were gang busting together and I loved it and I still love it and I'll always love it. <laughs> You know, my mother, her brothers and sisters, and all their peers was always gang orientated. Like, United Brothers and Sisters, the Tomahawks, Savage Nomads, the Sex Boys, all those things like I seen grow growing up. Like my mother's whole life was, you know, crime and robbery. After dark, the members of the Devil's Rebels, a teenage gang, roam the streets of the 83rd Precinct looking for trouble. This is how the night starts for the Devil's Rebels with heavy drinking. They drink beer and wine, 
and they pop pills, uppers and downers. Oh, yeah. The fire, because before you go to a rumble, you would go drink, uh, smoke your weed. Yeah, whatever you want, whatever, whatever was your bag, you do. The Devil's Rebels is a fighting gang. And on this night, they found their first victims outside a corner grocery store. In the middle of all this, a young man was stabbed. And the police were called. The first police to catch up with the gang found themselves outnumbered and they made no arrests. Later, outside the 83rd Precinct Station House, members of the Devil's Rebels threatened to kill the police. Were you charged with shooting a policeman? Yes. The last time I got busted, they told me, we're gonna catch you one of these nights and we're gonna kill you. Some people would say they'd be very worried if someone told them that. Why, why, why don't you? Because, you know, if I'm gonna die, you know, let it happen now, then later. Wally Savage and the other members of the Devil's Rebels gang are terrorizing the 83rd Precinct. And the city of New York, which spends a billion dollars a year to fight crime, hasn't been able to stop it. Um, shootouts went on 12 noon, 2 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock. And it really didn't matter who was walking back then, because they were shooting at us and we were shooting back, so. You know, I don't let nobody fuck with my boy. I wasn't even squeezing, man. You wanna do that to you? Honey, honey, I take that. Sunset Park, sandwiched between bed and Bensonhurst, gangs like the Assassinators formed in the late 1960s and roamed the increasingly dangerous streets. I was born, raised in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, been here all my life, and the Assassinators were mainly right in my every 49th Street was like the hot block. Everything went on on 49th Street as far as drugs, shooting, stabbings, clubs, everything went on on 49th Street. Anytime when I went to school, just because I was from 49th Street already, I, I was labeled as an assassinator because I lived in the area. My friends was assassinators. But yeah, I was 11 years old when I got stabbed. Say, I got stabbed three times, shot once, and it ain't fun. You either got a choice, the hospital, prison, or death. My brother, I, I still don't know to today what my brother did earlier in the day that it caught up to him and I was with him and protecting him, I got stabbed in the chest and in the leg. 49th Street and 5th Avenue, in the whole way to the pizzeria, and that's where I set up my colors, I became an assassinator, and do just about everything you could think of from robbing stores and breaking into uh, supermarkets and, and warehouses and the trains, the cargo trains and all that. In every borough, muggings and robberies became commonplace. On a typical night, at least 100 people are mugged on the streets of New York City. In some neighborhoods, knocking down people and taking their belongings has become a kind of street game. When the robberies began threatening the tourist trade in the theater district in Midtown, the NYPD began using decoy teams to lure would-be robbers and stick-up men into arrest. Within seconds, the police apprehend the two men. And on one of the men, the police find what they describe as cocaine. Around the corner, Detective Glotzel has signaled her backup team that her wallet has been taken. The police move in and arrest three young men. I saw an arrest, and I just came over to thank her so much for doing her job, because it could have been me. A combination of limited jail space and liberal judges created a ripe environment for criminals, especially juveniles, who, along with drug addicts, accounted for nearly all of New York's street crime. I call your name, you step out, you give me your address. New York City jails are usually full of men and boys waiting for trial, mainly on charges of street crime or drug offenses. Last year, the police arrested about 100,000 men and women but only 3,000 were convicted and sentenced to prison. The rest go free one way or another, and the police complain that they're arresting the same people over and over again. I was juvies. We was going in, and we was going uh, as uh, in C-74. You still had a fight, because in C-74, you were adults. And a lot of slashing, a lot, a lot of robbing. 
This boy was 15 at the time of his arrest with two friends for mugging and killing a man on the street. In a form of plea bargaining, he agreed to a second-degree manslaughter charge. The judge gave him 18 months in a state training school, the maximum legal penalty. The thousands of juveniles who are handled by our system of justice often find themselves in an overcrowded jungle. We go through the charade of bringing in and talk in terms of treatment and rehabilitation and certainly we have, don't have the wherewithal to actually do it. So as a result, he gets no treatment and very little rehabilitation and he is right back on the street within a very short period of time. We have to worry about society. We have to start thinking about the victims. Uh, they have rights too. We have to confine these hoodlums and, uh, and protect society. At 9.27 p.m. on July 13, 1977, New York City shut down. A massive power outage left the city dark for one long night, and for many New Yorkers, the 77 blackout brought New York to its lowest point. Looters burned buildings and ransacked stores across the city, with the Bronx and central Brooklyn being especially hard hit. <laughs> A thousand and thirty-seven fires were reported. Thirty-seven hundred arrests were made. The blackout cost the city over three hundred million dollars and helped cost Mayor Beam his job, as Ed Koch was later able to unseat him in the 1978 election by running as the tough on crime candidate. If the terror of street robberies and gang violence weren't enough to frighten the average New Yorker, the son of Sam was. From July 76 to July 77, someone randomly began killing women and sometimes their boyfriends too. It came to be known as the Summer of Sam and the normally quiet white neighborhoods of Queens, Brooklyn and the Bronx had their first taste of the terror of random crime. My wife comes screaming in the hall, they were shot. I ran down, by the time I got down, she was dead in the street. The first victim was killed in front of her Bronx apartment building last July 29th. She was 18-year-old Donna Loria. Since that first shooting, the killer has struck five more times. In all, nine persons have been shot, five of them killed. People wouldn't come out at night. They're really scared. And I mean, when they're scared, that's all they do is talk about the, the killer. I won't, I won't walk home anymore in the dark. It's, it's just scary. It's frightening. My daughter was 18 years old, and that's what he took out of my heart, 18 years. And I hope they get him. Officially, police say they are confident they will catch the killer, that it is just a matter of time. However, privately, some say they fear that someone else's time may run out before the killer's does. David Berkowitz was eventually convicted of being the son of Sam and has since become a born-again Christian behind prison walls, though some question the authenticity of his spiritual awakening. He was born again Christian, how could he have a uh, male part? Yes, yes. So yeah, he did have a boyfriend. Um, I heard the slash he got on his face in another jail was be behind that. Who's that? Um, David Berkowitz. That's why he got cut, I heard. I don't know how true that is, but he did have a lover, though. Though many considered the city to be at its lowest point, the seeds of hope were slowly growing. In the South Bronx, epicenter of youth gang violence and national symbol of urban decay, Africa Bambata, former Black Spades gang leader, helped formalize the various forms of street art now known as hip hop and to use them as a tool to turn young people away from crime and into creative expression. Everywhere you went, even in the subway train, you go in the subway back then, there was people rocking in the platform, outside of the platform, in the train, in the boardwalk, on, on the beaches. I mean, crazy. Everywhere you went, there was some sort of hip hop. When I started doing graffiti and all that, it absorbed me totally. It absorbed my whole thinking, my everyday priority revolved around all the hip hop thoughts I had. From the attire, from the culture, the graffiti. Like, even though I didn't do the music or anything, I listened to the music as a fiend. Like, it was my addiction. You feel me? Like, even though I ain't start rapping till late in the game, 
I already studied everybody in the book from the beginning. But Ronald Reagan's election in 1980 served to undercut much of this progress and New York's darkest days were still to come. Candidate Ronald Reagan, the South Bronx, August 1980. I'm trying to tell you, I can't do a damn thing for you if I don't get elected. Ronald Reagan did get elected, of course. In the South Bronx, a year later, the question is, what did he do for them? We just see a neighborhood really dying uh, under the Reagan administration. Mrs. Hamilton doesn't know whether the president means to be racist. She does know what his policies are doing. Certainly, the uh, indications of how, where he's putting his appropriation is hurting the black community. So if one would deduce from what he is doing, you would come to the fact that, that it, it's, a, it's a racist situation. As the 1970s drew to a close, the Mafia was engaged in an internal struggle for power after the death of Carlo Gambino, head of the National Mafia Commission. The most prominent victim was heroin overlord Carmine Galente, killed in Bushwick. As one police mafia expert put it, a contract was fulfilled this afternoon. On the receiving end of that contract was one of the top mafia chiefs in the nation, perhaps the boss of all the bosses, Carmine Galente. Galente was at Joe and Mary's luncheonette in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn. Four masked men armed with automatic weapons pulled up outside. Minutes later, Galante and two others at the table were dead. He was born in East Harlem, New York, and began his career as leader of a juvenile gang. In all, he spent 25 years in prison. He's believed to have killed or ordered the killing of about 100 men. The 69-year-old Galante was apparently involved in a power struggle for the number one mafia position. Galante lost today, but police still don't know who won. Between 1975 and 1984, an estimated $1.6 billion in heroin was brought into New York by one mafia ring alone, the so-called Pizza Connection, that dealt wholesale quantities of the drug from pizza parlors across the city. Federal agents say last night at 55th Street and 1st Avenue, 20 pounds of pure heroin were purchased. The heroin, with a street value of $20 million, happened to be sold to an undercover agent. It links a major heroin trafficking conspiracy with organized crime organizations already known to law enforcement authorities. By the early 80s, the gangs of Brooklyn were fading out, and as many members went to prison, died, or left town to escape the dangers of New York City. These four are about all that's left of the assassinators. Two died in gang warfare, and virtually all the others have been in and out of jail. One notorious member, alias Palo Viejo, was recently convicted of armed robbery and assault. Early 80s, that's when um, a lot of people started getting locked up. Drugs came into play. People started getting involved with drugs, using and selling. So independently, people started getting arrested. More than anything, the golden age of New York street gangs ended as cocaine swept through the alleys and tenements of the city and the old neighborhood turf wars were replaced by the even deadlier battle for drug territory. 85, there was just like hardly anybody on that. By 85, there was no gangs. Actually, I, I went away in um, 84. I went away because I had a daughter to, um, I moved to upstate when I had my daughter on because I didn't want her growing up the way that I did. I wanted to give her a better life, you know. April 15th, 1984, 1080 Liberty Avenue, East New York, Brooklyn. Police enter an apartment and discover 10 dead bodies, two adults and eight children ranging in age from 3 to 14. It is being called the worst mass murder in recent New York City history. In the rundown East New York section of Brooklyn, news of the murders drew hundreds of curious neighbors. They had heard how 10 people, two women, eight children, were shot dead, apparently by two killers using 38 and 22 caliber guns. It is believed to be a drug-related crime. There was one survivor, an 11-month-old girl. Police believe that the motive for the shooting was revenge for a drug deal gone bad. Narcotics paraphernalia was found at the murder site, the kind suggesting a small-time operation. Carmen Rossi, who owns the bakery next to the victim's home, was one of the first to discover the body Sunday evening. They were all sitting up, like, with the TV on, all with a bullet in the head each. And there was the baby on the floor, crying. In the underground world of Latin American-related drug deals, authorities say it is not uncommon for entire families to be wiped out. 
35-year-old Christopher Thomas was later convicted of the reduced charge of manslaughter for the 10 killings, his murderous rampage being ascribed to cocaine-induced schizophrenia. Thomas is still in prison, but his brutal murder of 10 women and children served as a harbinger for the most murderous era in New York City's history, the age of crack cocaine. Attention users and abusers. Down and out losers. Stop chasing that cloud that never, never fails, fails to elude ya. You. Your stem steady burning. Cause the fire stays hot. It's like 24-7. You're, You're at, at the, the crack, crack spot. spot. All across the city, rings of crack dealers sprang up like vampiric weeds. Some as tightly organized as a mid-sized corporation, others just loose confederations of dealers that claim the same neighborhood. It's not at all that unusual to see drugs being sold on street corners in New York City. For a long time, part of the city's Lower East Side had been described as an open-air supermarket for drugs. But a highly publicized massive crackdown on drug dealing in that neighborhood has had a dramatic effect. Since Operation Pressure Point began in January, police have arrested more than 2,700 dope dealers and addicts. Over $1 million worth of narcotics and cash have been seized in the target area, New York's Lower East Side, considered to be one of the nation's largest illegal drug marketplaces. The city is expanding Operation Pressure Point into Harlem, where the problem is even worse. The Jerry Curl Gang and the Wild Cowboys in Washington Heights. Boy George and the dealers around the hole in the South Bronx. The Baby Sam Gang, the Wild Bunch and the Eddie Holmes crew in Brownsville. All over the city, murderous rings of crack dealers generated millions of dollars a day and nearly doubled the city's homicide rate between 85 and 90. Nowhere was harder hit than Harlem, historical center of New York City's drug trade. No fear, baby. No fear. No fear what, nigga? We double what? We Harlem, nigga. 12 feet. This is where we at, nigga. This is our hood. We make it happen. Listen, 1990 over here was lovely because we wasn't happy. It was a shopping spree. You know how it go. That's all it was. Big candy store. The increased violence was almost totally concentrated in the African American community. The number of black homicide victims increased by 75% between 1985 and 88, while the number of non-black homicide victims increased by only 2%. It's widely known that violence is common in Harlem, but many argue it's also tolerated. As long as blacks and Hispanics fight each other, and as long as they do it in their own neighborhoods. Drug hotspots like the Lower East Side and the South Bronx saw their murder rates soar, and the three police precincts of Central Harlem were all in the top ten for murder rates across the city. How do you feel now? Bad, it was bad. Um, I happened to be, out of the first spots, the big spots, I happened to be working out of one of the biggest spots. I was literally coming out um, on the street with a bag with like 300 vials of crack in the street, in the middle of the street serving people. You ask me for five, 10, yo, how much money? Give them the money. It was uh, made you think is at that time and it was like, <laughs> Washington fall. Heights became the only place in the United States where wholesale quantities of cocaine could be bought right on the street like a $10 rock. I don't know how they got away with it for so long. Like, the Dominicans are run down on anybody. Like, if you, anybody who was of color and you was on a hundred and anything, a hundred and thirty, anything and through a hundred and... 70 and then Broadway and Amsterdam and all that shit, if you walk by, they was walking up on you. Hey, Bobby, I got good place. Ain't the ground. Come see me. Like, with no, with no remorse, no rebellion. Like, niggas was just running. You wouldn't know if you was a cop, nigga. You go, they take you to an apartment. Pull out the scale, what you need? 95 grand. Go, whatever they had in the cabinet. Boom, pull something, break it off, put it on the scale right in front of you. Boom. And you gone. Amidst the glamour of Broadway, crack dealers and users have set up shop. Enter the guardian angels, who were called in by some businessmen to try and clean things up. We've been cleaning up the crack dealers in the area that have proliferated. They're like everywhere, like cockroaches. They, they would even say the guardian angels acted like every other gang out there too. They were just trying to claim territory. 
just like every other gang, they were no different, man. The situation erupted last night. About 9 o'clock, a group of guardian angels and a group of alleged crack dealers began to fight. Six angels were hurt, one critically. I would see them everywhere I go. Them motherfuckers never stepped foot near us one single time. It's the first time this block has been clean. I think the cops are jealous of these kids. It's a damn shame. I'm tired of this place, Manhattan. I'm sick of these people around here. And I'm leaving right now. Crack is the most devastating drug that, that we've seen in the 20th century. It was two years ago that the warning went out about this highly potent form of cocaine called crack. Law enforcement officials feared that it would sweep across this country like a brush fire out of control. You start getting high, you really don't think about tomorrow or the next day. You know, the next day, you just think about, you know, how to get another hit. Remember the days when they used to give out free cheese on how long the lines were? Imagine that in one, not just one block, because when you go on 112th Street, you'll see a whole bunch of people gathered up, and you go right down the block on 113th and say, nigga, it's another crowd of people going to see some other people for crack. And right down the street on 114th Street, it's a whole other crowd. Like, it was, it was crazy. You know what I mean? Oh, but they were like yellow chops, blue chops, green chops. Every different block had a deal. Total free for all. But you had to compete. It was free for all long, you was willing to hustle. But back then, there was so much crack being sold. Crack cocaine shattered already fragile family structures and created a generation of parentless children. Everybody was on drugs. Everybody was fucked up. Like, one out of five families had somebody who was earning a good living with. It was fucking zombie land out here. Like, everybody was cracked up. You know what I'm saying? Niggas' moms, niggas' pops. It was crazy out here. They are born the nation's tiniest drug victims. They are growing into the country's most unwanted children. It is a population explosion. By some estimates, more than a third of a million babies will be born to addicted mothers this year, most addicted to crack. The babies begin life sick, often premature, suffering withdrawal from the mother's drugs. Mothers frequently vanish back into the streets and crack houses, leaving their babies behind for hospitals and overwhelmed foster care systems to cope with. So one day, my niggas like the show. We got a joint upstairs. She gonna suck everybody off and all that. I'm about 13, 14 this time, right? I go upstairs. I see the lady giving my man some head and all that. So I go back in the living room. When it's my turn, they call me in. It's a lady who knew my mom's forever. I remember I was in second grade. She told my mom she saw me and I, I was playing hooky. And she said she wasn't going to do me. And my man, he so wrong, he made her do him again because she wouldn't do me. Serious. Foster Bradley is a social worker whose job is finding those mothers. He's been beaten up and shot at on the job. Today he is lucky. He finds Stephanie, mother of two crack babies, now in foster care. Yes, I want to have my children, but I can't have them in, in, in the state of mind that I am. And with no financial, no financial help or nothing. Stephanie is back on the streets, back on crack, and pregnant again. Drugs. Drugs and either, either mama or daddy using the drugs, daddy selling the drugs, no one to be bothered. Drugs took a whole lot, not ever. It took a whole lot from the 80s. Like, it wasn't, it was, a lot of us grew up not in a standard home. Like, I don't, the standard home life is it's mama or grandma. That's the standard home life for my ever. It's part and parcel of so many young, especially black males, dying so early. They don't care, many of them. They have stopped caring. Right now, my man Fast Capone died when he was 17. He's somebody we talk about in our music. We have mules of him, we have everything. Fast Capone became a successful drug dealer at 16. You know, where he was already driving cars, and you know, in the ghetto, this ain't like the suburbs where you get your license at 16 and shit, like, he lived a life where you know, we all admire. He was from Brownsville, he was from Marcus Garvey Village, but 
according to the way he did it and how he did it and where he's from, it was still a success story in everybody's eyes, man. No matter how ignorant it may seem or or regardless of how, it's still the American dream. He was rising above what the fuck we were all succumbed to live with, man. But he got killed in his drug shit. He got shot 15 times. They shot him five times in the face. In the mid 80s, the prison population began to swell. Rikers Island seethed with racial tension and gangs like the Latin Kings, the Nietas, and the Bloods organized along racial lines. Got my first bit in 87. It was, it was rough. It was very rough. Um, again, if you wanted to get on the phone, you had to fight or pay. Um, you couldn't touch the phone if you wasn't producing what they call producing unless you was bringing drugs in, you had money, or you was blasting, you was, you, you was banging. I never saw as much racism as I saw until I went to prison. And I saw how racial Spanish people were, and I saw how racial some black people were, even white people. There was always blacks with Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans with blacks, but there was a lot of black and Hispanic wars. Um, there was a lot of Muslim and Hispanic wars, you know, five percenters and Hispanics. There was a lot of them wars. And then we had always the Bronx and Brooklyn war, which that's been forever, whether you was in clubs in New York or in jail. I went up north in 91. It's when I really first saw the growth and stuff of Latin Kings in New York City jail. I saw nothing but strength. The Spanish population was dominating the prisons in almost every prison. And more than anything, the Spanish means of survival and the way of that motherfucking razor and stabbing was a whole nother culture in the zone that a lot of people... Rikers back then, um, right from when you went in the gate, right from when you went in the gate, people was uh, looking to see what you had on. At that time, they took everything from sneakers to jewelry, to your jacket, to everything, everything you had on, all your possessions. If you didn't hold your own, you, you was done off. Um, Drug dealers drive around looking hard, no any sin in their brothers and sisters to the graveyard. Every day is amazing. The mass incarceration policies of the 80s and 90s had the unintended consequence of hardening unorganized criminals into prison gangs that spilled out into the street and roam New York to this day. December 22nd, 1984. The ingredients of fear stewing in the collective unconscious of the Big Apple all come together in the perfect storm of race, revenge, and violence on the L train. Bernie Getz, a self-employed computer repairman from the East Village, enters the subway at the 14th Street Union Square station. He is soon approached by four black teenagers. Getz drew his 38 caliber revolver and fired six shots at the teenagers. All four of the men were shot. Getz then, according to certain witnesses, approached one of them, aimed his revolver and said, you don't look too bad, here's another. Bernhard Hugo Getz, who in the shorthand of the street and the press has come to be known as the subway vigilante, was released on bail last night, a welcome home Bernie sign greeting him when he got to his apartment. Hey, do you have anything to say to the people who are out there supporting, supporting you? Thank you. Today, more signs of support as Getz went to court for a preliminary hearing. The shooting took place on just one subway in just one city, but Bernhard Getz and what he did has touched something in Americans all over the country. They're talking about him in Denver. Obviously, everybody's on Bernie Getz's side, and so am I. Um, I think what you're seeing here is people are saying they're, they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. Yes, and we terrorized the subway system on a great level. So we always got on at the last car of the train, but we robbed everybody from the last car all the way to the front on the same fucking train. You couldn't ride again. My first case was in 1989. My charge was 18 counts of robberies. I didn't, I didn't do none of them. The trains then, like, you couldn't ride on the trains. Oh, sure, Leave it open. You couldn't ride it then, like. I'm going to keep it real. Option number one, stand idly by and allow the hoodlums to kill you. Option number two is for the, to pray that the police can do it, even though we know they cannot. And option number three, the Bernie Getz solution.
who unfortunately is being called a vigilante. And if he's going to call him a vigilante, let's call him the good vigilante. For, it was, it was a robbery on a Jewish motherfucker that I didn't do, right? It was in between Saratoga train station and Rockaway train station. He was riding, going to his stop, and niggas robbed him for his Louis Vuitton book bag and a swatch watch. Swear to God, I was so fucking mad, because I ain't do it, but I got caught, you know, affiliation. All of the men survived, but one was permanently paralyzed and brain damaged. Getz became a hero to many New Yorkers who felt New York's streets had been surrendered to the thugs and criminals under Mayor Ed Koch. We think five criminally minded people met on the subway that day. When he put the gun in his pocket, he became the people he was fighting. He broke the law. He ended up serving less than a year on Rikers Island. Two of the men Getz shot were later convicted of raping and robbing a pregnant teenager. Their brain damaged partner won a $43 million lawsuit against Getz in the mid-90s. Getz claims he hasn't paid him a penny. I think there's a psychological delight that the people that have been pushed around for a long time are pushing back. I hope they find healthier and more productive ways to push back than by shooting people. Homicide peaked in New York in 1991. Black and Hispanic males were the primary victims and killers. At one time, son, remember we used to come out the house and we, we didn't even know if we was gonna make it back, you know what I'm saying, home, like, serious. Like, that's how Browns Browns it was, man. Like, coming out your house, you ain't know what was gonna happen, like. This summer, random gunfire killed at least six children here. Saturday night, this 11-year-old was hit as she slept in a Brooklyn apartment. Our babysitter told us, like, cause we can't go out in front of the street and like, by the sidewalk, on the sidewalk to play, we have to go in our yard because she said bullets have no name. I just came out the store, and that's when, matter of fact, that's when Sniggs was drinking Cisco's and all that funny shit. I just see a nigga walking, walking out in the motherfucking street. Nigga just came out of nowhere with a shotgun, just point blank range, just blew a nigga chest wide open. This kind of violence is going on every day in our communities. Grandmothers are being attacked, mothers are being attacked, kids are being attacked. And it's like, what do we have to do to have some attention focused on this and this dealt with? Soundview is just known for getting money, hustling, getting your head blown off, pretty much. We are announcing today a $28 million, 18-month program to upgrade security systems at the 40 public high and middle schools with the highest number of violent incidents. It was the city's answer to a series of shootings in the public schools. In the latest and the worst, two freshmen at Brooklyn's Thomas Jefferson High School were shot to death Wednesday by a 15-year-old classmate. The mayor was on his way to give a speech at the school when it happened. Ian Moore and Tyrone Sinkler were gunned down 15 feet from two policemen patrolling the building. Metal detectors, which have become a fact of life in many New York schools, were not operating in the building that day. There was only enough money to run them one day a week. A school is for education. You understand what I'm saying? A school is for education. Jeff, just like a, a war zone, Vietnam. A war zone like many parts of New York City where the combatants are well armed. Nowhere in America were you more likely to be robbed. Fort Greene, Bed-Stuy, and Brownsville had robbery rates as much as 20 times higher than the national average. Everything in Brooklyn is about taking and robbing. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't one of them kids who your mother disciplined you or, or scrutinized you for which when I came home, the more I would steal and the more I come home with, my mother would actually be proud of me. And all my other friends that steal and they and, and we stealing 50 coats in a day and shit like that, half of these motherfuckers couldn't take it home to their house. They could bring it to my house, though my mother ain't gonna say shit. I started getting my serious cases by like 85 and stuff, you know, a lot of robberies I was into. You know, a lot of the, the crime and shit I got into, my mother wanted me to go away. She sent me back to Miami to my grandparents and stuff. And once I got there, my grandparents really couldn't deal with me, and they sent me back within a month. And when they sent me back to New York, you know, it's was, it was the middle of the winter, and I didn't even have a coat when I came back. And the first day I came home and I didn't have a coat, all my friends was like, fuck that, let's go get some coats. And we went up to high schools, and we just robbed a bunch of motherfuckers for their coats, you know? 
In the late 80s, two groups that reflected the dark side of the American dream for fame and fortune by any means necessary were founded on the streets of Brooklyn. The low lives and the Decepticons, who so terrorized the high schools of New York that school principals would announce their impending arrival to students and let them leave school early. Running the same streets as future heavyweight champions Mike Tyson and Riddick Bowe, youths from Brownsville and other poor neighborhoods joined these two street gangs, infamous for their robbery and fashion. Low Life is a team of people who came together for survival in the street to eat, to dress, and for drama, you know what I mean? Sheepskin coats, leather bombers, V-bubbles and all that. Those clothes and those coats was like everything. So when a nigga gonna stick you up, they gonna stick you for them coats. And New York is a big value. That's something that motherfuckers get killed for. Man, we hear every store in New York. Not just me, you know what I mean? There are many that were way greater than me. To quote their official bio, the lowlife story is one of struggle, survival, and consequences. It is New York and hip-hop history with the pursuit of the American dream. It's the ghetto mentality nurtured by the realities of poverty and prison. Upper-class Fifth Avenue department stores meets the desperation of Brooklyn housing projects. You know, a lot of the rap rappers that were out in those times were emulating what we were doing on the street. They were trying to dress like we were dressing. They were following our style because we was in every hood, every state, you know, every borough, getting every bitch. They was just on TV portraying it, you know what I mean? Come to a Bismarck show and be on stage and hang with niggas while Big Daddy Kane is performing and, and all that, you know what I mean? Like, that, that's, that's how crazy our status was. Cause they know niggas is gonna be on that stage low the fuck down and this is what Brooklyn was. This represented Brooklyn in a big way. A Brooklyn nigga could tell a Harlem nigga from wherever, from in the 80s, 90s, until now. A Brooklyn nigga could tell a Harlem nigga from day one. And when them d set niggas was running around when I was in high school, I made the biggest mistake going there because I was all by myself. I ain't know nobody. I'm in class. I come to school. I'm fresh. Got my Gap sweatsuits on, chains dangling, rings coming out. You know what I mean? I'm a hollow nigga. Got my shit up. See the Brooklyn niggas outside my window point me out and all that, trying to get me to follow. I gave him the dip the first day. Next day, niggas came. I'm like, man, listen, I need to get out this school. This not for me. I ain't got no niggas here. I ain't no chump. But I'm smart. The d was running wild. Like, at that time, if you ain't have a crew of niggas with you, like, the d was coming for you. My name is Arseco. Like the watch, d what's the flavor? I mean, Brownsville, New, New York. We originated this year. You see it, look, it's D.C., look. Look up close, diamonds and all, yeah, it's DC, you know what I mean? And that stands for Decepticons, you know what I mean? Like, when I got Decept in, it had to be like probably 87, 86. Excuse us. It had to be 87, 86, you know what I'm saying? I was like 14, 15. Um, it's a rapper, which is our um, best friend. The leader of um, on Trigger Cons, his name is Sean P, best known as Ruck from Health the Skelter, yeah, I know. Boot Camp Click. That was our um, leader. One day they was initiating guys, and this man here whipped the kiss, came and got me, and he he asked me, "Yo, do you want to get down with a gang?" With this decent shit, like you know, initiation was you had to fight like 50 niggas. You know what I'm saying? No fair ones. No fair ones or nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have seen guys get jumped by like 50 guys go to the hospital right afterwards. Two weeks later, when they come out the hospital, they come right right to the park and be like, yo, am I down? Like, what am I going to school with these niggas for? I don't know none of these niggas. I ain't played ball in the park with none of these niggas. We ain't do nothing. Niggas don't know nothing about me, so they don't give a fuck about me. I'm out of here. But fuck that. He asking what what school? You should be asking what what school didn't do it. Man, Martin Luther King, um, um, Sarah J, Dewey, 
um, new you trick. Now, at this time here, this is 88, 89. We were actually the deepest game, New York City. We was like a thousand strong. You got Brownsville, Best Style, Crown Heights, Fort Green, Harlem, Bronx. It was like ABG, man. Anybody they could get, it, man. Like, niggas, they was getting raw for their book bags, man. Serious, man. Canal Street. That's what I was like. Canal Street. I was digging pockets. Digging pockets is when you just. <laughs> and you dig a motherfucking pocket and take everything so they got. Like in Brooklyn, that was a big thing. Motherfuckers from all over Brooklyn, Fort Greene, East New York, all the different projects. There were a lot of teams that was about digging pockets, like the Diamond District, 47th Street. Like anywhere they had these big major corporations, these people make a lot of money. And when they cash their checks, you can see the print on their pocket that showed the money. You know what I mean? Like, you, And all you got to do is creep up behind them and dig in their pockets and pull it out. Now, listen to me, I swear, and I'm gonna tell y'all now, if we was organized crime, right now, I'd have been doing 300 years. As new mayor David Dinkins took office, replacing Ed Koch, the city seemed to have passed the point of no return. New York has gotten so mean and so dangerous, the mayor actually went to church yesterday and pleaded with residents to come out from behind locked doors. To help, he said, against an onslaught of by antisocial forces that threaten to tear our city apart. The same week that a grieving Utah family buried 22-year-old Brian Watkins stabbed to death in a Manhattan subway, another family buried a young Bronx prosecutor killed by stray bullets as he bought donuts for co-workers. A series of racially motivated killings in all white neighborhoods culminated in the infamous Bensonhurst murder of black teenager Yusef Hawkins. It was not what the crowd wanted to hear. Keith Mondello had been found not guilty of murder, not guilty of manslaughter. It was Keith Mondello who allegedly led the gang of some 30 whites in its attack on 16-year-old Yusuf Hawkins last summer. Mondello was said to be mad at his ex-girlfriend, Gina Feliciano, for inviting black friends to a party in the white Italian neighborhood of Bensonhurst. Hawkins and three companions had only gone there to look at a used car when they were set upon by the mob. Hawkins was shot twice in the chest. Just me being there uh, doesn't say that I'm guilty, okay? And everyone has portrayed me as some racist killer, which I'm not. Hawkins' family believes his murder was racially motivated and was symptomatic of increasing racial tensions between blacks and whites in New York City. As new immigrants arrived in the city and old neighborhood boundaries dissolved, New York was convulsed by new kinds of violence. We go into their neighborhood, we get beat on, we get chased out. But when they come here, what are they doing here well, at 10 o'clock at night? Stop, 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 stop. Yesterday, the family celebrated the murder conviction of another white defendant, 19-year-old Joey Fama. The murder of Yusef Hawkins exemplified the hostility between New York's African Americans and its rapidly dwindling population of working class whites. You didn't give Moses and Diane justice. You finally, for once in this lifetime, gave black people a step towards justice. The Central Park Jogger case was the culmination of the media's obsession with white crime victims. When a female investment banker was attacked in Central Park, the media worked with the police force to try and convict a group of East Harlem teens for her rape. By day, New York's Central Park is a popular place for joggers and cyclists. But as night approaches, it can be a very dangerous place. One night last week, in this secluded area of the park, roaming gangs of teenagers, more than 30 in all, randomly attacked at least nine people. They began shortly before 9 o'clock, harassing one man walking through the park. Minutes later, they knock another man to the ground. Breaking into smaller groups, they beat a 52-year-old man who was jogging, throw rocks at a couple riding a bike, beat another jogger with a metal pipe. Then 12 of the teenagers attack a 28-year-old woman, hitting her with fists and rocks. Four of them rape her and leave her there unconscious. The police said there was no motive for any of the attacks. They said one of the teenagers explained the group had simply wanted to go what they called wilding. Wilding, however, is a term the kids from the tougher neighborhoods surrounding the park know well. 
is they go around yeah, and they do crazy things. They go around, they, they see something, all of a sudden something pops into their head and say, yo, let's go beat this person up. Dude, what, they sometimes do they do it for fun, Follow sometimes the they do it for money. You know what I'm saying? They just do it, just do it. There's nothing here for the kids. There's no recreational activities. You know, the community services, the centers, the, 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 the uh, organizations that are supposed to supply some kind of recreation for the kids, they don't do it. While the rape victim remains in a coma, the police have arrested eight teenagers, charging them with rape, assault, and attempted murder. Now that the police have learned what wilding is, they're now looking for ways of taming it. It is argued by some the reaction to the Central Park attack is an example of what is wrong. The New York Police Department quickly beefed up security throughout the park. While back in Harlem, where there are many more crimes and many more victims, the police say existing patrols are adequate. In late 2002, all of the convictions in the Central Park rape case were vacated due to the confession of Matias Reyes. The crime that signaled the beginning of the end for widespread street-level drug dealing occurred not in Harlem or Brooklyn, but in South Jamaica, Queens, when drug gang members gunned down NYPD officer Edward Byrne. I sat at my son's wake. Our streets could end up being as lawless as the streets of Bogota and Beirut. Uh, individually, we cannot take on the drug dealers. They are an army. They are a massive army. It may not look like it, but there's a big battle raging in these streets of Jamaica, Queens. On one side, the largest police force in the country. On the other side, drug dealers, armed to the teeth and with untold wealth. Police are trying something new here, a tactical narcotics team called TNT. It's a coordinated effort by city, state, and federal officers, and more than 100 of them are closing down crack dens and arresting drug dealers. Many people in the neighborhood are afraid, and some say TNT is only a Band-Aid. We need an army, a big army. A, a bunch of tactical narcotics team, TNTs came out, and so on, they, they just, Shut it down. <laughs> Shut it down. Then when they started making the undercover thing, TNT, they started raiding every house, every point, every spot. Well, I was involved. I was getting busted by the cops myself. After 70 years of trying, the federal government finally broke the old mafia in New York. From prohibition to heroin to the estimated 20% mob tax on all new construction in lower Manhattan, Cosa Nostra extracted a heavy toll on the city. The bosses of all five New York family members, either in jail or awaiting trial. During a decade of vigorous federal prosecution, a long parade of mob leaders has been brought to trial. In the last five years alone, almost 100 top mafia leaders have been convicted. Authorities are having more success because a new generation of mob leaders is deeply involved in drug dealing. Drug charges carry tougher sentences than gambling and other crimes. And mobsters have been turning more often to violence to settle disputes. Thousands of murders, millions of drug users, billions of dollars. The old dons paid a heavy price. Many died in prison. John Gotti left court today in this government van, heading back to jail. There would be no triumphant departure, as there had been three times before, Gotti was either acquitted or government charges against him were dismissed. Nothing had stuck to the Teflon Don until today. The Teflon is gone, the Don is covered with Velcro, and every charge in the indictment stuck. Gotti was accused of ordering the murders of five people, including Paul Castellano and his bodyguard in 1985. Castellano was then the reputed head of the Gambino crime family, the largest in New York. Gotti, the government says, later took over the syndicate. The prosecution's star witness was Salvatore Sammy Bull Gravano, once Gotti's closest lieutenant. He often showed up with his boss on government surveillance tapes. Gravano testified that he helped Gotti plan the Castellano assassination. Prosecutors said audio tapes from bug conversations proved that killing or having someone whacked was a routine part of his business. Prosecutors also cite the disintegration of traditional mafia loyalty. Sonny Francesi, son of a longtime mob leader, is only one of dozens of mafia members to turn informer. 
organized crime uh, is on the run in virtually every city in the United States, if organized crime law enforcement keeps its commitment to the war against organized crime, I think by the end of the century we'll see an end to it. In the mid-1990s, the Federal Prosecutor's Office, fresh off their success in bringing down John Gotti and the Mafia, began applying the RICO statute to groups in the inner city. The streets have changed. New York has changed a lot because of the RICO law. In the Soundview section of the Bronx, a man named Pistol Pete Rolak came to their attention and they made him a centerpiece of their campaign to sweep the streets. Well, in the 90s, Giuliani came into office, man. It became crazy for us, at least for my neighborhood. I know where I'm from, Soundview. It got kind of crazy for us because we was one of the first areas that the Fed stepped in and started taking down after they took the mob down. Once they took Gotti down, it was over. Mr. Pete, that's, that's, that was like my brother. We grew up since we was like... 10 years old, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Went to the same schools, you know what I'm saying? Did pretty much everything together, you know what I'm saying? But when, when, when it was time to do certain things, they'd be like, nah, P.O., nah, go to the courts, mo. Get your, get your ball game on, because you're going to be the nigga to take us out the hood, go to the NBA and shit and all that. And a lot of people get it misconstrued, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people think, you know what I'm saying, yo, he was a monster, he was this, that, this, and the third. This was the coolest nigga you've ever met in your life, you know what I'm Pistol already was fighting a charge in, in, in North Carolina. And he already got hit with 30 years out there, you know what I'm saying? So Pistol was going to do time regardless, but what happened was the Thanksgiving Day murders happened. And um, allegedly, you know what I'm saying, somebody in sex money was, was you know what I'm saying, informant. And they saying that, that, that Pete sent the kite that, um, you know, got him killed on Thanksgiving Day because we always have a football game in this area. Due to Rolex ordering murders from prison, he was one of the first U.S. federal inmates put on the controversial no human contact list in which his contact with all outside parties, including family and legal representation, is severely restricted. They, they implicated saying that um, he, sent, he sent the hit out and that's what really got the, the DA, the prosecutors, to really make it a big, big case. You know what I'm saying? Saying they killed the federal informant and all this and all that. You know, a whole bunch of bullshit just to make it bigger than what it is, you know what I mean? He got convicted of, um, I think, um, 17 murders, no, eight murders that they knew about. And, you know, being kingpin, you know what I'm saying? And head of the sex money murder, you know what I mean? So they had him on the kingpin status. And what they was going to do, you know, they didn't have nothing on him. A couple of niggas turned on him, you know what I'm saying? Snitched on him. But that still wasn't holding no weight. So they, you know, they tried to implicate his moms in this shit, you know what I'm saying? So once he did that, he said, man, I'd rather do life in jail than them niggas. My, my mom spent one day in jail, you know what I'm saying? It was like a 200-man indictment in my neighborhood alone, you know what I'm saying? Which is kind of weird to me. I'm wondering why the fuck is the feds stepping in, you know what I'm saying? The so-called 112th No Fear Gang in Harlem was another group of loosely affiliated drug dealers that shared the same neighborhood that the federal government applied organized crime style investigations to in the late 1990s. But then in November 1996, the black conspiracy where they took everyone, 31 co-defendants, like from conspiracy to murder. And you know conspiracy is the easiest charge to, to stick. All you gotta do is catch a case on the block. I mean, they made it seem like it was gang related, like it was an organization, but it wasn't no organization like that. It wasn't no meetings called where niggas, this is your position, this is how this is going. Everybody looked out for everybody. We just ain't have no fear, we ain't feel nobody. That's why they end up getting the name No Fear, but it never was a gang. So we gonna straighten that out right now. It wasn't There's like, no it gang. was a gang and it no. was a leader. That's what the police say, so that's all bullshit. Yeah. He can look yeah. good. Kelly know he a scumbag. He had to make it look yeah, good, but. He, he, made, he made it look, he made it. All that was, the No Fear thing was, we wouldn't let nobody come and rob people in the neighborhood, stuff like that. Right. And we always had love for each other. That's right. And we just wouldn't let nobody bother us. That's right. And from on 96 on, when you start looking at it, Harlem became different. They started putting up new buildings. By 2000, the whiteys started realizing how close Harlem is to where we gotta get. They switched that whole shit around. Harlem don't look like Harlem no more. And I mean, it, it, it looked clean, it looked, it looked good. If, if you ask me, honestly, the shit looked better. That shit looked like Midtown. Like it, it, ain't, it ain't out of the ordinary no more to see a, a white person walking down 125th or 116th or 112th. Yep. They, they, they lived there. 
The streets of New York have changed, but the question is why? The police say it was them. Good morning, attention to roll call. Heading out on their first patrol of the new year, the officers of Manhattan's Midtown South Precinct hit the streets with a new sense of pride and a new reputation to uphold as keepers of the safest big city in the nation. We used to be called the crime capital of the world, now we're just the capital of the world. As the ball dropped on 1997, the crime rate in 1996 became one for the record books. Since 1993, robberies have dropped 43%, assaults are down 31%, car theft is down 47 percent and perhaps most significant in softening New York's reputation for mean streets there were fewer than a thousand murders for the first time in almost 30 years the kind of murder and the kind of attack that most frightened people being attacked by a stranger has diminished to uh, very very small numbers Computers now track every crime committed in the city every day, allowing cops to react instantly to changing crime patterns. In addition, the police are cracking down on what they call quality of life crimes, like traffic violations, subway fare beating, and public drunkenness. And those small busts lead to bigger busts and safer streets. B before G Giuliani, like walking around with a gun, it was like, used to match your gun with your clothes. You got cameras everywhere. It's, it's, it's just as similar as being in, in a correctional institution where you're being monitored all day long. You're being summoned for any inappropriate activity. You know, back before Giuliani, like, you really had to carry a gun. At Brownsville, like, you know, I used to go to Queens and I used to just carry an ice pick. Giuliani put a lot of bullshit in the game where for everything, he was going to jail. He was going through the system. Never before have so many been arrested for doing so little. Now, in the process, the police may have sent out a message to would-be criminals that they had better leave their guns at home. It comes from the consequences, not the community. Because if you left it up to the community, they, they, they destroyed this bitch a long time ago. The old ghettos of Harlem and the Bronx are being gentrified but many of the black and Puerto Rican residents who suffered through the years of crime are being replaced by whites and new immigrants. Blacks out, whites in. You know, Street to 155 is mostly Dominican owned or somebody else owned. You don't see too many blacks owned and none young. If you get on a train on 116th Street, all you gotta do is go to 34th Street. You get on a train, you're there in 15 minutes. You couldn't get on the Long Island Railroad from East Montauk to get to the city faster than that. The subway runs good, like we get better service with the white people. The street cleaners come through, the streets is clean damn near in Harlem. And I, I can remember when I was in Rucker one time, shout out to Booby Smooth because he said this shit. The nigga said, if you don't start buying property in Harlem, I'm telling you now, whitey's coming back up here and they coming to take this shit back. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. The same energy and entrepreneurial spirit that New Yorkers applied to robbing and drug dealing turned towards the hip-hop industry as the streets were slowly shut down in the 1990s. Same, the same way we was in, in the 70s when my old, older brother and them was coming up, they had nothing, you know what I'm saying? And they created something called hip-hop, you know what I'm saying? Our backs was against the wall, you know what I'm saying? And they created something which opened the door and allowed a lot of motherfuckers to come through and get a, 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 a legal check. When I really started rapping, I really started rapping. So anybody who was a real hip-hop lyrical nigga, you can't deny what I was bringing. You know what I mean? M saw that, I saw what he had, and it all took off from there. We made records together too. We did stuff on Raucous and shit like that. That's why they're so mad now that you know, hip hop has really controlled the mind state of the world, the world abroad. And so many of these ghetto bastards, so called, are becoming fucking rich op entrepreneurs overnight. Successful people with money and now a voice. You know what I mean? A voice to make change. It's crazy. But my learning experience from being around. The type of hustlers put the thought in my mind where I can make moves where I'm at today. Like, I do music, 
Murder Mook, my artist, Blackface Entertainment, you know what I mean? I wake up with something, thinking of something new to do, what I can do to make this Blackface Entertainment better. The same way a nigga in the streets would wake up to make, man, how can I make these 200 grams, 400 grams? And after them 400 grams, I want to make them 1,000. Fuck 800. Yo, my name is P.O. CEO, co-CEO of Bang Bang Boogie. That's my song, Cuban Links, Lord Tariq, Hocus 4-5th and S1. The things we doing is pretty much bringing the Bronx together. I really want to put this Bronx shit back where it's supposed to be because this the, is the birth of hip-hop. That's the birth of hip-hop and niggas forgot about us. Some say the police and Giuliani did it all, but the people changed too and the truth of why crime declined so much in New York City may never be known. My, my time was my time. When I was young, I liked to hang out. I liked to have my 40 and drink it, you know what I mean? But as you get older, you don't want to do that at 40 years old and hang out in a corner and drink out of a 40 ounce. Just the people, the people changed, I changed. You know what I mean? As time went going by, I felt, you know, it's time for me to mature, grow up and stuff. And, and it's not just me, a lot of other people. We change for the better because people have progress. They have moved on. People have been strong about what they had to do. They live with a lot strong. of drugs out on the streets. I'm, see, I, I got had to pay a restitution to that. You know, I had to pay a restitution because I was killing my own kind. I was genocizing my black people doing so. So realizing that, being the man that I am today, I'm like this. I'm going to live and let live, and I'm going to keep it real. And the reason why I keep it real is because I've done it. We got like a thousand po police around this motherfucker. So Brownsville is safe. So all y'all Harlem and Bronx guys and, you know what I mean, Queens, y'all could come to Brownsville now because it's a lot of police out, out here now, man. <laughs> Word. Y'all could really come now, I swear to God. Central Brooklyn, less proximate to the prime Manhattan real estate than Harlem and the Bronx, has experienced a smaller decline in crime than the rest of the city and is now the city's crime capital. This is only safer for, like I said, economic and financial purposes. This is, this is the business capital, man. This is the world trade. Even though the towers are not here, this is still the world trade center of the world. People gotta understand that. That's why it is what it is. Everybody going to Atlanta. That's they call that shit the new New York. Like North Carolina, Virginia. Everybody leaving, because they, they, they know the, the cost of living up here is getting out of, out of hand, you know what I'm saying? The future is now for many of the people that made the streets of New York in the 70s and 80s. Former gang rivals have come together to fight the demons they fell victim to in their younger days. That's your brother, King Class. The dude what a lot of other, uh, this has become, I mean, something for me, I mean, it's something so beautiful. And we all talk about it because we hang out in clubs. We, we, we was uh, raised in an environment, uh, uh, a negative environment where, um, you know, it was few who made it out um, as survivors. We were again um, joined as assassinators, as club members, Dirty Ones, Cherry Queens, uh, and so on, all the other clubs. And we're all looking at a positive thing now, um, where we're gonna work with the community, help the community, and hoping and the community for the kids, for will the support future. us. And peace to all of y'all, assassinated all of y'all. Assassinated love to Terry everybody. Queen. Terry Queen. Forever, forever, the streets of New York have changed, but the question is why? The police say it was them. But while the zero tolerance policies enacted under Giuliani produced many new arrests, there is no scientific evidence that it brought the crime rate down. In fact, the decline in crime started in 1991 under Mayor David Dinkins, who increased the size of the New York police force with the help of federal dollars. But it's always something. They, they, it's like they got a they got a hard on for niggas over there. Like they always find a way to try to fuck something up. Especially now what we doing with Bang Bang Boogie. They try to say that we a gang, you know what I'm saying? Trying to say we sex money, you know what I'm saying? Just because we from this area, you know what I'm saying? And they just snatched niggas oh. last month, you know what I'm saying? They just did a raid, snatched the whole hill. They just snatched the whole Castle Hill, you know what I'm saying? Like 25 niggas. My man Dollar Bill, he in there, they got him on kingpin charges, you know what I'm saying? They got S1 and Hocus, which is artists in Bang Bang Boogie, and they locked up right now trying to fight this shit, you know what I'm saying? Hocus. Okay. We just, I just got through talking about you and what's going on, with, you know what I'm saying, what we doing as far as the music and all that. And you just called out of nowhere. So, um, you can hear him? 
Oh yeah, you already know, Hocus Smokes fit, Big Big Boogie, man. Castle Hill, please represent us. BXO A, shout out to our prophet. The streets of New York, DVD, man. Call us from Mike Casano right now. Y'all niggas know this. I'll be home very soon. In the end, the story of crime in New York is the story of money. Only when the entire city threatened to implode and collapse under the weight of crime did the government spring into action. Only time will tell what the future holds, as the streets of New York have always had a life of their own. Hey yo, I never sold my soul for the gold born in hell So my soul wasn't mine to sell Keep hungry, green money, junkie Dollars of the colors in other countries Can't go to your block, can't come to mines Gangs of New York carry nines out of line Body in the backseat, been trying to dump Can't fit it in the trunk, it's filled with